Welcome to Settle Conversations, the podcast that brings you insights and perspectives from the experts and personnel in higher education. Settle Conversations is sponsored by the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at the UWI St. Augustine campus. The CETL, or Settle, is a unit that supports and promotes excellence in teaching and learning through research, innovation, and professional development. Whether you are a faculty member, a learner, or just curious about higher education, this podcast is for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation. Welcome. I am Leroy Hill, and welcome to today's Settles Conversation. With me today is Professor Rory McGrill, and we are honored to have him here in Settling's studio to really talk, um, to have a very short conversation about OER and open education. Uh, professor Rory McGrill uh, is professor in the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies at Athabasca University, Alberta, Canada. He is also the UNESCO International uh, Council for Open Education, Chair in Open Educational Resources, and is the director for the Technology Enhanced Research Institute. Um, you know, in addition, he is the editor-in-chief of Canada's first open access journal, you know, a uh, very wrong, uh, renowned and popular journal, um, the International Re Review of Research in Open and Distance Learning. You know, I, I can continue to speak of Professor uh, McGrill accolades and his accomplishment, but I really want to have that conversation with him today, and I want to invite you, Professor, welcome to Settle Links, welcome to our Settle Studio, and I'm hoping that you um, uh, really had a good one week, one week with us. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I had a great time. Wonderful. Great. And I mean, in terms of open education, um, what inspired you to become an advocate for open education resources or open, ed ed open education on a whole? Well, um, since I was very young, I've uh, always uh, been a supporter of education. I, I became a teacher. I taught in both uh, elementary and secondary schools. So right from the very beginning, I have. And very early on, working in Canada's uh, far north, I was uh, introduced to distance education and uh, learning through distance means. And I took courses uh, from way up in the Arctic and uh, uh, participated with other students uh, um, by telephone and by video. And this was in the 1970s and 80s. And so uh, I have a long history of supporting education and making it accessible to everyone, everywhere. And uh, in the 1990s, I got involved in... Uh, the learning object movement, and uh, we uh, we worked very strongly to create objects for learning that we could put on the web and make use of them and use them any way we want. And what we discovered was that the main impediment to doing that was the licensing, wow. and that uh, having restrictive licenses stopped all kinds of uh, possibilities for innovation. And so then I began to become more interested in open learning and just getting, um, making, annulling the effects of copyright. And uh, um, that's how I got into the open learning movement. And uh, I've uh, been pushing it ever since. Uh, uh, UNESCO came up with the term open education resources in the early 2000s, and that's when, yes, I went from learning objects, which could be commercial, which could maybe not commercial, but they were restricted, and to open educational resources, where with the Creative Commons license, they can be made open and accessible to everyone. Yeah, that's, that's powerful, because uh, you mentioned earlier that the <coughs> licensing was a barrier, but uh, were there any other challenges? Um, before we go on to really define what open education and OER are, I'd really like to, what, what were some of the additional challenges that um, towards open education that you think um, that encouraged open education? Well, the, uh, the first challenge is, uh, and it still exists today in many, in, in many parts of the world, 
is access to the technology. And so in the beginning, in the 1990s, most people didn't have computers. And so what we did was we set up uh, computer stations, uh, workstations in different isolated rural communities that people could go to and access the computer. And then we set them up in schools. All the schools in northern Ontario, I worked on uh, uh, these very remote uh, they're like islands, they're land islands, these remote villages way up in the forests of northern Ontario. And uh, they have schools, and we set up uh, uh, computer stations there uh, for delivering courses for so students could participate in courses using, um, at that time it was audiographic uh, uh, technology. So they'd use a, a writing board that could be transmitted over the phone lines. And uh, as the internet uh, became more popular, we, uh, we switched to the internet and started using uh, the internet. And uh, in, uh, I think, around 1994, 95, when Mozilla came into effect, the, uh, uh, the visual internet, the World Wide <laughs> Web, and when that came in, I realized that that was a, a, a really life-changing moment for everyone okay. and for educators in particular. And uh, uh, from then on, we supported internet courses. We built the first uh, uh, repository for internet courses, uh, for links to internet courses. And uh, I, I've been on that road ever since. Well, and I'm glad I took well, it. Well, I mean, if, if you were to <coughs> deconstruct open education, open education resources to someone for the first time, how would, you, how would you define it? How would you explain it to them? Well, uh, the way I explain it is I try to make it as, as simple as possible. And the simplest possible way for people to understand it is that it's a textbook that you get for free. And then you explain that it doesn't have to be a printed textbook. It can be an online textbook. Okay. And then I can say, well, it doesn't even have to be a textbook. It's a online learning content that you can use. And the key characteristic of it is it's free for the teachers to use and it's free for the students to access and make use of. And, and, and the, the, I, I think that's the power, one of the many things you see that it's, access persons having access to it yes um and you, you know unesco pushes the whole idea of education for all and i think that fits very nicely with um the whole idea of open education uh in in the higher education setting with your role at atabasca university you've played a key part in the i would say the theoretical through the journal but if if from the practice component if you can speak to a little bit about your work in the in the journal as well as the practice in terms of encouraging. I know you've hinted some of it already through your work of um, installing computers and encouraging uh, learning objects. Um, but if you can share a little bit of the theoretical, because I know you worked with quite a number of different persons at Atabasca in, in advancing um, um, open education. Um, well, mine, uh, I, have, I have mainly focused on, uh, on the practical. And in fact, I have an award as a practitioner, not as a researcher, but I have done um, some significant research, particularly in uh, uh, the definition of uh, learning objects and working with UNESCO on the de definition of uh, OER and, and the uh, different uh, uh, ways of approaching open education resources. Uh, but my emphasis has been on um, the Strategic Development Goal 4 of UNESCO, Education for All. And uh, I was impressed uh, very early on by uh, John Daniel, the former CEO of uh, the Commonwealth of Learning, um, who predicted in 2015 um, that there would be over 1 million students capable of post-secondary education, higher education, who would not be able to access it. And that we would have, if we did it with conventional means, we would have to build two universities a week of about 30,000 students each in order to meet this demand. And we realized that, no, 
we can't do this by traditional means. So we have to find new means. And for that, uh, um, I'm a big supporter of uh, mass education, okay. is how can we reach huge numbers of education in a cost-effective manner. A, a lot of educational faculties, they don't, they don't like you to, uh, uh, to say that, that, that you can reach, have, have courses with hundreds of thousands of students. And uh, we were often ridiculed for it, but now with massive open online courses, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is becoming a reality and becoming a possibility. And now with artificial intelligence uh, agents, um, the help for students can be available to them online when they need it, where they need it, and how they need it. And so it is becoming possible now for us to educate huge numbers of students in a cost-effective, efficient, and uh, uh, without sacrificing excellence. Yeah. And you mentioned the word excellence. I, I, I want to <coughs> perhaps dovetail in the whole idea of quality. Um, some persons may critic um, OERs that they, they not necessarily are quality. Um, how do you ensure that OERs remain, uh, have that sort of quality uh, that person can respect? Well, the idea that if you put a CC license at the bottom of content, that this makes it inferior to one that has C copyright restricted on the bottom of the page is just, it's ludicrous. I mean, it, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, what you have to do to judge the quality is uh, uh, of an OER or of commercial content is that the teachers who are teaching the course, the instructors, they look at it and they look and say, yeah, this is good content. <laughs> and, and if they can't do that, then they shouldn't be teaching the course. Yeah. And so they look at it and they say, yes, this OER is good. Now, uh, you won't get too many teachers to agree. They'll often say one will say this is great and the other one won't like it. And so there has to be flexibility. And I believe the answer to that is to create many different open education resources. Because we're finding that now, too, is the students who, who go to class and they learn about a concept and they don't get it in class. It's not explained to them that's good for them. And so they go online and they find another way of explaining the yeah. same concept. And, and do that very effectively, yes, too. I mean, and that's very effective. Yeah. I, so I, we, we need multiple ways of explaining the con different concepts. And I, and I think this is where... Um, you know, the whole idea of UDL comes in very nicely. Yes. Multiple pathways. <laughs> and um, I, I, that's not the topic of our discussion, but at least it comes in very nicely <laughs> there because it, it, it really gives the, the option. And I think the, 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 the power of OER is that it encourages persons to create multiple things and different things, podcasts, yeah. uh, you know, uh, and different versions of podcasts. And so persons might say, okay, I prefer this one because it's more lively. It speaks to my cultural context. And um, I, I think this is, is perhaps very, very empowering because it gives, it gives teachers the, the option to repurpose the content in their own setting and, and adopt it uh, as they see fit. I'd, I'd, I'd like to find out any, uh, I mean, you mentioned artificial intelligence, and I'm, I'm really interested in, the interse intersection uh, between artificial intelligence and uh, open education. I, I, I foresee that it's, it's gonna, it is a challenge, um, uh, but what are some of the recommendations would you give uh, to someone who is trying to uh, use AI and also follow open education philosophy and thinking? Um, how, how, how can they use AI to act, you know, push forward the open education agenda? Well, as you know, it, it's come to the fore very recently, and I've been doing a lot of thinking on this, and uh, um, everything about this is a challenge to education, not just online education, but educators everywhere. And uh, I'm looking at it from the point of view of the uh, OERU, the OER Universitas Initiative, where they have courses online that any learner can access. And if they want credit, they go for an assessment at different institutions that are participating in the OERU. 
And uh, one of the main um, uh, aims of the OERU was to create a, a group of professors who would, retired professors and volunteers, who would help students because we were wondering, you know, they're struggling on their own with this material and how can we help them? And now I think that we don't need those professors. Mm. That if they're struggling and need help, <laughs> we have an AI tools that can help them. And so everyone and everyone can access them. Yeah. And so it's taken away that major impediment to mass education and working mm. Uh, and being able to study on your own and uh, get credit for studying on your own. So uh, that's my uh, uh, big part of, uh, uh, of AI. I mean, there are other, yeah. other things and other approaches, but that, that is the one I want to focus on. Now, you mentioned earlier about uh, research, and I've looked into it, uh, whether we can use AI to review articles. Yeah. that have been submitted. And so far, no, it's not good enough that I've not seen. Okay. Uh, they're too positive yeah. and too uh, and not specific enough. And so um, I don't think this will always be the case. <laughs> I think that uh, as it gets better and better, they will be able to review. Mm -hmm. And what I foresee is not that we get rid of our human reviewers, but we use that as one of the tools to check with the reviewers, so as when we give feedback to uh, uh, to our uh, 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 contributors, that we uh, uh, we have the OER uh, evaluation as well. Yeah. Of course, also I would suggest to them that uh, they put it to an o, uh, an AI review before submitting it to us, <laughs> which would be even better. So as they. Uh, they catch most of the things that an, a normal reviewer will do. Yeah. Uh, but I, I must say, so far, it's not quite there. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did see during our, um, our workshops on the OER policy that we did use AI to do a comparison yes, and yes. to see what it did. And it, it was helpful, minimally helpful, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, it... it it, it was a sort of a check on what we've done and it was able, we were able to compare and see, yeah, we've done pretty well all the things that AI is recommending. And oh, here's something that we missed and we discussed that and decided whether or not we wanted to include it. Yeah. I mean, Professor, you've been our, our champion for open education and open education resources as a chair of uh, UNESCO chair of op open education resources at, um, I'd be interested in finding out, I mean, yes, we've done the workshop here. What else can we do to deepen our culture of collaboration around the whole idea of, of uh, open education resources and open education? Um, any suggestions? Well, the big problem here is everywhere is mm -hmm. the lack of awareness. Okay. What we find is that when faculty become aware of OER, they're supportive, mm -hmm. and uh, um, we've got to uh, make them, number one, make them aware and then train them in how to find them and use them and to uh, promote very strongly, you know, don't create your own course. Look first. Is look first, find <laughs> one that does it, mm -hmm. and also um, uh, I, do, I do believe we have to be uh, careful of our, our cultural sensitivities in Canada we are very um, cautious about taking American material. Okay. Why is that uh, so? We consider our education system to be superior to <laughs> the American education system. <laughs> and <That's interesting. laughs> and uh, this, uh, in some cases, it's true. In others, it's not so true. But that's what Canadians believe. And so they try to uh, um, not use or... or adapt American material and sometimes it becomes fet fetishist mm -hmm. fetishistic because so that's a barrier in itself the cultural yes, because I mean you had one where they were doing a, a phys I remember a physics course and they had it was a train going from Washington to to New York and 
the Canadian uh, adapters of the OER, they had to change it from Toronto to Montreal. Well, I mean, you're getting a bit silly about yeah, it at some yeah. point. Like, you can use foreign, foreign material. Students don't mind learning about foreign. In fact, sometimes it's an advantage to have that stuff because it's a bit uh, exotic for them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so at the same time, if you have very serious issues, uh, like, for instance, in sociology in particular uh, in Canada, the American view is very different from the view in Canada. And oh. so um, they just don't use uh, the OER that are created in, in sociology in the United States, uh, um, or they may not. Um, we do have American professors at Canadian universities <laughs> who may use it, may use it. Uh, but uh, they fight over it all the time. Oh, my yeah. You know, this this has been a very important and uh, crucial um, point uh, in terms of the future. I think persons are looking at the, the power and the future of open education, its utility in doing certain things. In closing, what can you tell us? What is, what is the future of um, OER, open education? What is the future of open education? Well, I think that we really have to uh, break at some point with the power of the commercial publishers who are uh, uh, charging huge amounts uh, for their content. And uh, um, they are the most profitable industry as a percentage wise of any. And I'm talking about educational publishing, okay. not just publishing overall, but educational publishing very expensive um what they do is they find that uh, uh the the uh, instructors uh the 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 writers of the textbooks etc who do it uh, uh get marginal remuneration from it wow. and the publishers make huge amounts of money and charge all kinds of uh, uh, uh very high prices for their textbooks and everything and now we're moving online and now there's so much material available online as OER. Some of it is not OER, but you can still access it online. Yeah, you and you have every right to access it online freely. Mm -hmm. um, that we can move away uh, from this commercial uh, publishing and make uh, education much more available, co cost available to, um, to, to students everywhere uh, in the world. In fact, it could be it could be free, yeah. and uh, if we do, do that and use artificial intelligence, use uh, massive open online courses, and uh, uh, we get students trained in in the early years to become independent learners, mm -hmm. uh, then I think uh, I I think we'll be on the right track, because mm -hmm. they need to be independent learners because nowadays you have to be learning your whole life. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, it's, it's a never-ending. Um, I think lifelong learning is uh, a trait that we need all students to be to be at the cutting edge. I mean, I, I, I honestly think that um, the future of open education, and it, it brings back, for me, the view of Ivan Illich, who spoke of Lynn Webbs in the 1970s, mm -hmm. long before the internet. Yes. And, uh, and it's amazing to see that you don't have to restrict yourself to university. You can learn um, where you are, anywhere, anytime. Uh, barriers of space, time uh, just diminish because you have the internet, you have technology. But with OER, I mean, I think this is, as you mentioned, this is where I think the power of OER would be um, able to transform lives because they are continuously learning and have that attitude or mindset that they can, they can learn. Professor, we, we don't want to, to to uh, be here for too long, but we want to say thank you. Thank you so much for passing around in the studio and sp spending your time. We really enjoyed the time at the workshop with you. And I don't know if there are any closing remarks you want to make, but we want to say thank you at this time for having the conversation at uh, Settle for us here at Settle. Okay, well, my, my main closing remark is uh, um, as far as uh, implementing open education resources is uh, just do it, but do it by taking free resources that are out there. <laughs>
and making use of them. Adapt them if you want. If you don't want, don't adapt them, but use them because mm -hmm. the, they're available. And uh, um, I, I'm surprised that they haven't caught on as, as well as I, I thought they'd catch on much faster. But they are catching on. Yeah. And uh, um, the, uh, another point I'd like to make is about the OERU initiative and mm -hmm. credentialing. Oh, yeah. That credentialing, so people do learn online. They're learning all kinds of things online, uh, but their their credentials are not recognized. Mm. And this is a big problem. And so the OERU is one answer to that problem, um, or it could be. It, it hasn't really taken off yet, but uh, um, we hope to. We have to find ways of ensuring uh, that people, what they know is recognized. Yeah. And the skills they have are recognized by some body that will be acceptable to uh, to people. So, and, in, in short, do you think, therefore, the future of OER would mean that universities have to rethink the way they are creden they're recognizing, uh, credentialing um, their programs? Uh, I'd say uh, yes for most. Now, at Athabasca University, we're an open university, and we have... Uh, we have what you call a uh, challenge for credit. Yeah. So if you say, I know uh, second year physics or second year uh, French, whatever, we give you a test. And if you pass the test, we give you the credit for that. Yeah. And uh, very few universities have that. And so more and more should have it because uh, uh, in Canada, we have a huge problem about this. We have the most educated taxi drivers in the world. <laughs> they're people, they come to Canada, they get in, uh, their immigration status because they have uh, uh, credentials abroad, and they come to Canada as a doctor or uh, as a, uh, uh, a plumber, as mm -hmm. whatever, a tradesperson, um, a, a pharmacist, and we don't recognize their credentials. Mm -hmm. And so... And not only that, there's no pathway for them to get credentials. Okay. And uh, the gov some of the provincial governments are working on that now, uh, but it's a huge problem. It's, uh, it's terrible because we need all of these skills. That's why we let them in the country, and then they get in the country, and they have all these regulatory problems. So credentialing and the recognition of credentialing and, and recognizing what people really know and the skills they really have is, mm. is, is, is essential. Okay, Professor, thank you so much. Thank you. I really learned a lot <laughs> listening to you. I wish I could stay here forever, but we know we don't have much time. Until next time, thank you for tuning in to Settle Conversations, and we want to thank you for um, being with us. Remember to subscribe, like, and share when you see this podcast. I'm hoping that you will smile because someone out there um, is benefiting from learning more about open education resources. Thank you so much. Until next time. Settle Conversations, the podcast that explores dialogue with key experts and personnel in higher education. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to check out the links and resources in the show notes for more information. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on your favorite platform. Until next time, stay curious and keep learning.